All right. Now, last week, and even this works, we saw last week that Jesus speaks of his return in judgment in chapter 8, verse 38. And then he says in chapter 9, verse 1, as I understand it, that some of those present will be given a visionary preview of that event. And that happens in chapter 9, verses 2 through 13, which is the transfiguration. That's where he selects Peter, James, and John to accompany him up the mountain where he's transformed before them. They're given this supernatural manifestation of his glory. And Mark mentions that his clothes became dazzling, brilliantly white, whiter than anyone on earth could bleach them. Luke says his appearance uh, of his face changed. Matthew says that it shone like the sun. And this manifestation on the mountain of transfiguration of Jesus' glory, it is an unmistakable visual revelation. An unmistakable visual revelation of his true identity as the Son of God. And in seeing it, Peter, James, and John, they're given a preview of the kingdom of God coming in power because it's at Christ's return. It's at his second coming when he returns in power and glory to consummate the kingdom that he inaugurated at his first coming. That's when his true identity will be visually and unmistakably revealed to the world. For as lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. That's Luke 17, 24. And at that time, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, as Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 11. Now on this mountain, Elijah and Moses appear, and they're speaking with Jesus. Now, these two great figures of Jewish history, both of them are associated with the coming of the Messiah, the kingdom bringer. Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, that the Lord would raise up a prophet like him, and Peter links that promise to Jesus in Acts chapter 3, verse 22. And based on Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, the Jews expected Elijah to return in advance of the final day, to come in advance of that, the final day of the Lord, which implied that he would come in advance of or in conjunction with the Messiah. So here you have these two Messiah-affiliated Old Testament heroes These great deliverers of God's people, you have them here speaking with Jesus, which serves further to cement his identification as the Messiah. So here you have these two figures. Now there have been various ideas about what motivated Peter to to offer to build these shelters or these booths. You know, was he trying to prolong the experience? Was he seeking some kind of worship or something? But Mark indicates that it's an off-key suggestion. You see, that's what's important, I think, is that Mark signals for us that whatever Peter was saying, it's somehow an off-key suggestion. He said it just because they were so afraid. You see, if he'd have been thinking all that, he wouldn't have said it. It was just something that manifested the fear that they all experienced. So as readers, you see, we're not to read too much into that because Mark tells us that it was simply uh, something that came out. It was an indication of their fright. And we're not told how the disciples knew that the people were Moses and Elijah, whether that was divinely revealed to them, whether Jesus told them and that telling wasn't recorded. We're just not told, and presumably we're not told because it's not considered important. And there's a cloud that overshadows them, which in Scripture often symbolizes the presence of God, this idea of a cloud coming. And then God announces from the cloud, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. This is my son, the beloved, listen to him. 
as at his baptism. This identification of Jesus as God's son. That's probably an allusion to Psalm chapter 2 verse 7, a messianic psalm in which God speaks of the nations raging against his Davidic king. So it's probably an allusion to that and the command to listen to him. That's probably an allusion to Moses' statement to the Israelites in Deuteronomy 18.15 that they must listen to the prophet like him God was going to raise up. And that includes, you see, accepting what Jesus tells them about his suffering and about the implications of that suffering for discipleship. Listen to him. You see, he's telling them things, and you see them balking and resisting. And I understand why. But he says, listen to him. And the fact Moses and Elijah, they suddenly disappear, leaving Jesus. That confirms Jesus' preeminence. So they're there part of this vision. They suddenly disappear, leaving Jesus. They serve only a supporting role in the revelation. They're not center stage. They serve a supporting role. The revelation is about Jesus. The revelation is about the Son of God, the one to whom they must listen. He fulfills and he transcends all that was revealed through Moses and the prophets. The prophets, of course, being represented by Elijah. And Jesus tells them not to tell anyone what they'd seen He says, until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Don't tell it, don't say what you've seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And as Strauss comments, he says, this probably relates to the to popular expectations concerning a political Messiah. You see, Jesus is concerned about people uh, getting the wrong idea thinking, Messiah, I know what that means, and then running with that idea. So he tells them not to say anything about what they've seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. He says this probably relates to popular expectations concerning a political Messiah. Jesus wants to prevent premature proclamation of his Messiahship until he has fulfilled his messianic task. The glory of his messianic reign proleptically in in preview form, proleptically seen in the transfiguration, will not be realized at his first entrance into Jerusalem, but after this suffering, death, resurrection, and ultimately at his return to judge and to save. So this, he tells them not to say anything until this resurrection. The disciples kept the matter to themselves, but they discussed what it meant They discuss what it meant to rise from the dead. Now, we look at that and we say, what do you you mean? You know, uh, what's the ambiguity in that? Why don't you understand? Well, we're where we are. They're where they were. And whereas most first century Jews, most of them believed that God would raise his people bodily from the dead at the last day, the day on which he judged and remade the world. And you can see that illustrated perfectly in John chapter 11, verse 24, with Martha's statement. But but you see that. So this expectation, you see that God, there's going to be this resurrection at the end when God judges and remakes the world. See, but that's one thing. But they didn't expect, you see, they didn't expect that this this end-time resurrection this rising to immortal life. They didn't expect that to happen to someone in advance of God's remaking the world. You see, they they understood that was happening, but here you have this idea of rising from the dead here within history. And so that just doesn't compute. That's not on their theological landscape, so they don't think that that's what he's talking about. So then that puts them in the thing of just rejecting that because that doesn't even come up. Then they're trying to figure out, well, what does he mean by that? You see, that's what's going on here. They expected everybody to be resurrected to immortality together in conjunction with the final judgment and the beginning of that eternal state. As Mark Strauss says, Jesus' discussion of the resurrection of the Son of Man 
within history, before the end, was inconceivable to them. You see, it's, and that's how we are. We have grids and things that the way we think about things. And so if that's not part of your grid, that's why I say you and I, who have the understanding of what's going on when he says it, we say, well, that's obvious what he's talking about. Well, this is what's going on with them. Now, apparently their discussion about Jesus' reference to rising from the dead, that discussion that they were having, it seems to have raised an issue regarding the teaching of the scribes that Elijah would appear before the great day of the Lord and thus would appear before or in conjunction with the coming of the Messiah. And Jesus says Elijah does come first to restore all things. So they had some issue that had been generated from their talking about Jesus rising from the dead that dealt with Elijah's coming. And Jesus tells them Elijah does come first to restore all things. And then he asks in light of that, in light of the fact that Elijah comes first to restore all things, how is it written about the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? You see? He presumably has in mind texts like Isaiah 53.3. How's it written? He presumably is referring to texts like Isaiah 53.3, Psalm 118.22. And he seems to want the disciples to understand that Elijah's restoring role. So they're asking about that. He wants them to understand that Elijah's restoring role will not be inconsistent with his predicted suffering. It seems they've got some, why do they say he's coming again? And Jesus is telling them, yes, he is going to come again, but he wants them to realize it won't be, that's not inconsistent with his predicted suffering, that won't be something that precludes that suffering because they're trying to make sense of what he's saying theologically. So they have these questions and these, yes, Elijah's coming, he does come, but he wants them to recognize that that doesn't rule out what he's telling them about suffering. And then he clarifies in verse 13 how the prophesied Messiah comes. By informing them that he's already come. You see, referring, of course, to John the Baptist. In other words, Elijah doesn't come in a literal, raised from the dead sense, which is how most Jews understood that prophecy. Rather, Elijah comes figuratively in the person of one who reflects the spirit and power of Elijah as was said of John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1, verse 17. Now, John the Baptist's treatment, they're doing to him, they're doing to John the Baptist whatever they wanted, that was written about in Scripture. And we think, well, what do you mean it was written about in Scripture? Where is that? Well, it's written about in Scripture in that Elijah, the one John represents, he was treated by Jezebel, the king's wife, with no regard for his spiritual status and his life. Indeed, she had him running for his life in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 to 3. And though Elijah wasn't killed, that same lack of regard for his spiritual status and life that Jezebel expressed, that same lack, that resulted in John's execution at the behest of Herodias, another king's wife. You see, that's what's going on here. So their doing to John, whatever they wanted, was foreshadowed in the persecution and the suffering of Elijah. So that's what he means when he says, as it's written about him, you see, as it is written of him. That's what he's talking about, because you won't go back and find John the Baptist in the Old Testament. You will find Elijah, and you will find that rejection and that lack of regard for his spiritual status, who he is, and for his life. And that then plays out in Herodias, a king's wife, having John executed. 9, 14 to 29. I've busted this up into two slides, where Jesus heals the boy with an evil spirit. Now, when Jesus and the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, that he's taken with him to the mountain of transfiguration for this preview. Now, when they come back and they return to the other disciples, they see a large crowd is around them, and the scribes, 
the large crowds around him and the scribes are arguing with him. And when the crowd sees Jesus, it says they were greatly amazed. Now this is an odd uh, word here, that they were greatly amazed. As Strauss notes, he says the verb suggests strong emotional distress or alarm, something more than just excitement over Jesus' sudden appearance or his celebrity status. So what's going on here? Now, we're not told why they were astonished, why they had this particular reaction to seeing him. What produced it? Now, one speculation is that he bore some of the residual effects of the transfiguration, a result similar to the fear of Moses' appearance that, that was evoked, that Moses evoked when he returned from Mount Sinai. You remember with his radiant face, you see in Exodus 34, 29, and 30, he comes back and that evokes fear in people. Well, maybe that's what's going on, but we're not told, but it's an odd word that's, that's put there. Now, Jesus asked them, he asked the disciples, the scribes, or the crowd, he asked them what they're arguing about. And a man in the crowd answers him and says his son's possessed by a demon that prevents him from speaking and it produces symptoms like foaming in the mouth and rigidity and this kind of thing, these epileptic-like symptoms. And so it keeps him from speaking and produces these symptoms and he asked the disciples to cast it out, but they were unable to do so. So he's got this demon-possessed son, comes to them, asks them to cast it out, they're unable to do so. And this presumably brought an accusation from the disappointed father with agreement from at least some people in the crowd that the disciples were not as advertised. You know, here he comes, I hear about all this stuff, doing all this stuff, I come here and bring my, my possessed son to you, and you whiff. And so it presumably brought this accusation they weren't as advertised, and then the scribes apparently used that accusation to press their argument that the disciples, and by extension their master, were phonies. So that seems to be what's going on, and Jesus addresses them all with this emotional, personal address, O oh, unbelieving generation. You can just see the Lord here. He does that because the Father... Presumably some in the crowd and the scribes, they were skeptics or outright opponents. And the disciples had a faith that was inadequate to move them to rely on prayer for the task. So Jesus says, O oh, unbelieving generation. Then his two rhetorical questions in verse 19, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? They reflect his disappointment and his, his frustration over their persistent unbelief. I mean, the Lord is just here, you know, he's dealing with us. And you just see this, this in his heart, just how long, you know, you know, we'd put it like, what is wrong with you people? What is wrong with you people? But he forges ahead on his mission, calling for this boy to be brought to him. And when the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into convulsions. When the Spirit sees the Lord and the distress of the boy's condition, the direness of his condition, it's indicated by the description of the seizure, the fact that the Spirit had possessed the boy for a long time and had possessed him from childhood, and the fact that it posed a danger to him, his life by throwing him into the fire and bodies of water. So the seeming hopelessness of this boy's situation, fueled by the disciples' failure, it caused the, the father's faith in Jesus to waver. You see, it caused that faith to waver so that he, he couched his request in terms of uncertainty. He, he couches it, his request for that healing, in uncertainty. He, say, he says, but if you can do anything, if you can do anything, 
he asks, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus then challenges the man's doubt about the sufficiency of his power for the task. And he says, if you can, you know, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. See, what's humanly impossible becomes possible, though not guaranteed. It becomes possible to those with faith in God because he has the power to do anything. And he exercises that power on behalf of those of faith. Though not automatically, not mechanically, but within his sovereign purpose. You see, that's what he's telling him. Now, desperate and fearing that his lack of faith might be an obstacle to his son's healing. He cries out, I believe. I believe. You see, and that's a conscious, that's a conscious decision to make a public declaration of his belief in Jesus' power to do the seemingly impossible. He wants that, I believe. I don't care who's here, what they're saying. I don't want to be an obstacle to my son's healing. I believe. I will say it here. I'll say it anywhere. So he does that. He shouts that out. But then he adds, help my unbelief. You see, which is a, it's a plea for Jesus to do whatever needs to be done to strengthen his faith that he might no longer waver as he just did in beseeching Jesus for the healing. You see, there he wavered. He came, they couldn't do it, then he says to Jesus, if you can do anything, he says, if you can, I believe, help my unbelief. You know, help me avoid that kind of wavering when circumstances and things get to me. And then seeing that the crowd was continuing to grow, or seeing that the crowd was gathering around the area to which Jesus perhaps had led the man. Jesus acts quickly. Now that's again, that's presumably as part of his management of his reputation for purpose of his mission. And Jesus rebukes the spirit that we now learn also causes deafness. So he can't speak, he can't hear, throws him into seizures, throws him into the fire, throws him into water. So Jesus rebukes the spirit, and the spirit cries out, convulses the boy, and leaves him looking dead, and Jesus takes him by the hand and raises him up. Now when they go inside, they go inside, the disciples ask why they couldn't drive the demon out. I'd want to know that. They were asked why he couldn't do it. After all, Jesus had given them authority to drive out demons in chapter 6, verse 7, and they had done so previously. They'd driven out demons. In, Matthew, in Mark chapter 6, 13, Jesus says, This kind cannot be cast out except by prayer. This kind can't be cast out except by prayer. Now that suggests that some demons are more powerful or more difficult to expel than others. You know, we, I mean, there, there's apparently there's this ranking or a difference in demons. And some of them are more difficult to expel. They're more powerful. And it also suggests the disciples may have started to lose sight of the fact that their abilities to drive out demons, that those abilities derive from God, and that maybe they'd started to think that it had been, that it had been, in, had been vested in them in a more autonomous sense. You see, a way that was not so dependent on the intimate faith relationship with God that is reflected in prayer. See, maybe they'd started to think that, okay, we have the power. That the power has been given to us in an autonomous sense that it's up to us and we do these things. And it started to lose the connection. Which is somehow, by the way, 
uh, how I think Samson began to see his power. I don't think Samson would ever said, yeah, the, here, it's here. I've never done this or that and cut my hair off. If he really believed that the power was from God and not inherent in himself, I think he thought that he had the power. And he learned, mm -mm, your power is derivative, it's given to you. And I think that's what's happening here, is they're in danger of thinking that, the, that this had been given to them in an autonomous sense. And they need to learn that that's not the case. You see, they need to, uh, they need to be called back. And I think this possession was a reminder to them, a call back to call them back to their dependence on God. So that's what Jesus tells them. And then in 930 to 32, he gives his second passion prediction. And he gave his first one, Jesus, and Peter rebuked him. So here he gives his second one, and he leaves the area of the transfiguration. Okay, he leaves here this area. Possibly he leaves from Mount Hermon, which is near Caesarea Philippi. And they're passing through Galilee, and they're en route to Capernaum. And Jesus didn't want the people to know. He didn't want them to know. It says because he was teaching his disciples. And the crowd obviously makes that difficult because they put so many demands on him. You see, he wants to have some time to teach the disciples. And he carves out time to do that where he's not always being pulled. Heal this. Do this. Feed this. People pressing up against him. So he didn't want people to know. He wants to teach the disciples. And he was teaching, he was teaching the twelve that he's going to be delivered into human hands and killed, but would rise again three days after being killed. Now, most commentators understand this. He will be delivered. They understand that is what's called a divine passive. You see, referring to God's purpose in delivering Jesus up as a sacrifice for sins. He'll be delivered up. God is going to deliver him up. Paul speaks of God's delivering, with the same word, God's delivering his own son in Romans 4.25 and 8.32, 1 Corinthians 11.23. Now Jesus' statement about rising after being killed, again, this simply doesn't compute for the disciples for a couple of reasons. The notion that the Messiah, the one who's destined to establish the eternal kingdom of God, it doesn't compute that the Messiah would die. I mean, that's incomprehensible to them. And again, they, like most first century Jews, they took as a given that the resurrection would happen on the last day, the day on which God judged and remade the world. They didn't consider the possibility that this end-time resurrection could be split into two phases. That this end-time resurrection could begin with an individual in advance of God's remaking the world. So having not considered that plain import of Jesus' words, they're looking for some other meaning and they're coming up empty. They don't understand it, they can't comprehend it, and they're afraid to ask Jesus what he meant because they didn't want to appear dense. They didn't want to look, you know, what do you mean by that? And, you know, they, they, they just figured we ought to know this. And they don't want to look stupid. So they're afraid to ask him about that. And then in 33, in 33 to 37, Jesus addresses this argument the disciples are having about who's the greatest. Now, on the, on the heels of, of his second prediction of his suffering, on the heels of that, there's another failure to accept that teaching. His first prediction, he's rebuked by Peter. His second prediction of his suffering, we have a failure to accept that teaching or at least the failure to accept the implication of that teaching for his followers. That's really the sticking point a lot of times. What does your suffering and death mean for me as a disciple of you? 
You see, if the king comes riding in glory and all this and triumph, I'm with the king. But if the king comes getting crucified and suffering, ooh, what does that mean? See, what does that wind up meaning for me? So this is, you know, they have this, they are, there's this failure to accept the teaching or at least the implications of it for his followers. Followers, When they're in the house in Capernaum, which is probably Peter's house, Jesus asked the disciples about, about what they'd been arguing about on the way, and they didn't answer because they didn't want to admit that they had been arguing about which one of them was the greatest. You see, in the very fact they don't answer, that shows that they had some sense of guilt of having done so. They knew at some level that their argument over that subject was something with which Jesus would not have been pleased. So when he asked them, what are you arguing about? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. huh, we were just talking. You know, they didn't, they didn't say anything about it. Now, whereas Peter rebuked Jesus when he first told of his coming suffering and death, the disciples ignore the implications of the Lord's coming suffering and death for discipleship. The fact is that one cannot follow Christ. One cannot follow Christ if one is enamored with rank or status. Because his call is to follow him down a road of shame and humiliation. His call is to take up one's cross and follow him. One cannot, just as one cannot serve God and money. You see in Matthew 6, 24 and Luke 16, 13. One must choose. One cannot serve both God and money. Well, in the same way, one cannot serve God and status. One must choose. And that's what the Lord is teaching them. And it's illustrated beautifully in the life of Paul. I mean, Paul was educated at the feet of Gamaliel. You see, in Acts chapter 22, 3, Gamaliel was a teacher who was held in honor by all people, Acts 5, 34. And Paul was advancing in Judaism beyond many of his own age, Galatians 1, 14. Paul was a rising star. He was a scholar, an academic. He was on his way. And what happened to Paul? Well, Paul became a disciple of Jesus. Now, to hear some people tell it, what that means is Paul will then go on, he'd become president of the university. Okay, he would then continue to advance and to grow in power and status and prestige and the world would continue. And he would, because he hooked his wagon to Jesus, would then everybody in the world be going, oh, what a great man Paul is. Is that what happened? No. Paul was considered great shakes. Then he became a disciple of the Lord Jesus. And after describing his pedigree and his standing as a Jew, Paul then says in Philippians 3, 7, and 8, But well, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. So Paul understood. He said, Paul, uh, do you have greater status in the world now than before? I, I think the phrase Paul uses, we've become the scum of the earth. The scum of the earth. So Paul would say, no, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 10 through 13, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you're wise in Christ. We are weak, but you're strong. You're held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we go hungry and thirst. We're poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor, working with our hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Well, Paul, what was your life before you became a Christian? I was a rock star. What is your life now? Well, in the world's eyes, I'm scum. 
I'm hated. Do you see? Jesus calls the 12 to him in verse 35. And in a world, this is hard for us to get back to, but in a world of, of strict social distinctions and hierarchy. That's how the ancient world was, particularly the Greco-Roman world. These strict social distinctions, very aware of social distinctions, rank, status, and hierarchy. Jesus there, he calls them together, and in that world he teaches them a shockingly countercultural truth. Greatness in the kingdom lies not in rank or status, the kind of greatness about which they had just been arguing, but rather it lies in making oneself a servant of others. In other words, not simply serving, but taking that lower role, the servant role in relation to them, being willing to accept that. Not being enamored with status, not being enamored, but being willing to be seen as the servant, the one who's lower than that person. Instead of saying, no, I gotta, I gotta step over this guy. I gotta get up. Well, that's, that's completely countercultural. What Jesus is saying for them to do. Completely countercultural. And Jesus, he then illustrates the point. He illustrates the point by taking a little child in the house. Peter's child, perhaps. But by taking a little child in the house into his arms. Now, unlike modern Western culture, another thing that's just very difficult for us to keep from reading into the text, but unlike modern Western culture, Little children in the ancient world, they were not romanticized and fawned over. You know, they weren't looked at as the key to everything. Certainly they were loved. That's inherent in being a parent. They were certainly loved, but they were not romanticized and fawned over. Mark Strauss says they were viewed as insignificant and having no social status. David Garland says the child had no power, no status, and few rights. You see, in receiving, so what's going on in receiving, you see, or welcoming the small child, Jesus lowered himself. He lowered himself. He broke a barrier of social status. These guys have no standing. They don't have anything. They're like nothing. And what does Jesus do? He embraces this one of no social standing. And in doing that, he demonstrates his point that these kinds of barriers, they are not to impede serving in the kingdom. We are not to be fixed on rank and status and see the world in this hierarchical way. You see, we have to get away from that and he demonstrates it there. And then having taken the child, having taken the child in his arms, he says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Now Jesus seems to be saying here that the child represents his disciples. The child represents his disciples, those who are received in his name. You see, those who are received in his name, in the sense that they are received as bearers. Disciples are received as bearers of Christ's name. And little children serve as ready representatives of disciples because those who follow Jesus, they embrace a path of no social status, a path of social rejection and scorn. And because we have grown up in a world that for a long time seemed favorable, we have forgotten the setting of the first century where this is the reality. The world hates Christ. 
No, 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 no. You're, you're being hard. You're, the world hates Jesus. I mean, this is as plain as the nose on my face when I look out and see. But this is the reality of what's going on. So here they are. The children who have no standing are ready representatives of disciples who walk that path, that path of social rejection, no status, no standing. And so they are ready representatives. And that's why he says that receiving one such child is receiving him. Receiving this child who represents a disciple is receiving him. Jesus is represented by his disciples. He's represented by his followers. In receiving them, one receives Jesus. And in receiving Jesus, one receives the Father who sent him. As Strauss says, he says, The image here is that of an emissary sent by a king to, quote, receive that person is to offer one's service to the king himself. You see, and that's what he's saying about disciples. Those who receive a disciple in his name because they are disciples, they are receiving him. And in doing that, they are receiving the one who sent him. So you see this, this going on, and this is how and the implications of this, you know, how we are and how we are to be. Okay, good, because I was going to say I'm ready to start these next couple of verses, but I know I'll get interrupted. And see, see the movie. Paul, yeah. apostle, see it. You'll love it. <laughs>